Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Casey. This is Coach Tom. This is Shot Science Overtime number 68. Um, if you're here right now, you're either uh, one of the early birds or you're uh, watching the recording, and you know, thank you for being here. Um, we just uh, are going to get underway here in just a second with your questions and everything. But first, what we like to do is we like to have a topic that we talk about. And while we're doing that, you guys can send us your questions about anything basketball related. So if you want to know more about dribbling or how to shoot more efficiently or how to defend better, send us those questions either on Twitter or on Facebook, Google+, in the chat. Uh, let me kick off the Q&A app here. That should get going. You can send them to us here on Google+. Um, and then also make sure that you go out there and tell your friends to watch or your family, whoever. Uh, I know it's Mother's Day, but get out there and tell everybody you can to watch because that'll help us be able to get more cool guests for you guys. Um, you know, in the past we've had uh, NBA players like uh, Danny Green. We've had some um, some NCAA coaches, some former coaches, some, some coaches that help kids get into – collegiate programs uh, with their uh, traveling teams and clubs and stuff like that. Um, we've had some former NCAA players. Um, so if you want to have more people like that, definitely get out there and tell people to watch the show and send us their questions because the more interaction we have, the better we can, we can get those people for you. Okay, so start sending us your questions. We are at Shot Science on Twitter. That is the best place to catch us. And we're going to jump right into our topic right now, which is how to make more shots, um, and it's kind of it's kind of a very broad topic. But the thing is, is that there's multiple parts that we can talk about. The first is how to make your shot more efficient so that you're more accurate. Yeah, you know, one of the things that I'm seeing more and more today uh, on the internet and whatnot are people who are professing ideas uh, that's going to make you a better shooter. But you know what makes you a better shooter? Uh, getting really good form. Uh, elements, um, whether it be how you hold the ball, how you release the ball, uh, your stroke mechanics, all of those things are really important in doing that. And there is no magic pill or no magic solution that is going to allow you to make shots uh, unless you develop those good mechanics. And you know, the, the well, thing and is... Good, and good mechanics too means efficient. Efficient mechanics, right. Because the more things that you add in or try to do while you're trying to shoot the more complicated it gets, yes, and, true. and the more things that can go wrong. Yep, it's like yep. adding extra components onto an engine. It's like eventually one of those things is just going to crap out, and you're going to have yourself a really you know bad day. And the right. same thing is true with shooting. Well, it is. And you know, one of the things that that uh, I dealt with yesterday uh, uh, with a shooter, and this is a fairly common situation, uh, struggling with a shot. And what we uh, um, what we determined was this that. A very common thing that happens is that uh, the thumb of the assist hand, uh, when it leaves the ball, it is still on the ball at the release. And what happens is that as the shot goes off, this thumb tends to take and create uh, a sideways rotation on the basketball rather than one that is a true backward rotation. And not only does it do uh, um, that sideways rotation, but also kind of pushes it off the line that you want to make the shot successful. So uh, those kind of elements are really important for you if you're going to take and be successful with the shot. Uh, the thing that is really important too is that it takes time uh, to figure all of that out and get it working for you. A uh, young man yesterday, uh, third lesson, and he hadn't really spent very much time on his form, and we had to spend probably the first half hour just trying to kind of correct his form, and then it got better and better as the day went on. But if he uh, today, if he were to do it, he'd have to go back and revisit all of that again today to make sure that he was going to have an effective mechanics for the shot. So now, you know, the, the, all the elements that, that, are, that make a, a shot effective, whether it's your how you use your legs, how you use your arms, how you use your eyes, uh, and certainly how you use the stroke mechanics are all super important in you being successful when you shoot. And, you know, there, like I mentioned a while ago, there is no magic pill, no magic answer as to how you can become a much better shooter unless you get all of those elements that are working in concert uh, to make that shot better. And uh, well, I, I, and that let me take just a second here on that case. And that all comes from practice. And one of the things that I often respond to to people 
uh, on their questions to me is this. They'll ask, well, how can I get this to be better? Oh, the answer to that question commonly is this, that it is practice, practice, and then practice some more, and that's when you begin to get the elements so that they are more efficient and so that they are more effective to make you successful. And, and you know, here's, here's one thing that I think is super important, and I, I know you'll agree, is that you need to logically approach how you put together your shooting mechanics. Right. Everything that you do should have a reason that that not only makes sense to you, but also makes sense when it when it stands up against uh, you know uh, some kind of testing. So you're doing this because of uh, a mechanical reason or a biomechanical reason, not just because somebody else does it or you see somebody on TV do it. I mean that's that's not a good way to put together your shooting mechanics. Uh, you know, you know, I know you want to be like Kobe or whatever. You, that, but you don't want to start there. You want to start with the fundamentals, build it up, and be, uh, and you know, put things together for your body in the way that you work. Right. And the best way to do that is to make sure that you are being as efficient as possible. And that that is is one of the toughest things for people because they want to look cool while they're doing things. They want to, or they hear somebody talking about some other thing that they can add in. You shouldn't really be trying to add in anything to your shooting mechanics because that will not likely make you a better shooter. If you have all the elements in place to begin with, then you're going to be uh, kind of in the right place. You just have to put in the work to make those things pay off. Yeah. And you should always be analyzing what you're doing. Um, are you missing short? Are you missing off the front rim? Uh, is that because you're pulling your arm down and, and the shot's flat? Are you uh, missing off the left or right? Is that because you're finishing with your finish off to the left or right? You should always be looking at those little elements and tweaking them and if you are listening to anybody even if it's us you need to evaluate the things that we're saying and make sure that they make sense to you in your brain and not listen to people that are disparaging others or cutting down concepts because they 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 think that it it doesn't uh, you know comply with what they're saying you need to think in your brain does this make sense and typically, if somebody's telling you to add something extra to your shot, that's not a good idea because you want things to be efficient. The more efficient it is, the more repeatable it is, the more repeatable it is, the more accurate you can be every single time, and the more accurate you are, the more the ball goes in the basket. So that's where you get the points to, to happen. So that's how you make more shots, right. efficiency. Well, you know, another thing that comes into this, and this is just kind of a... Uh, um, voice what Casey's saying, one of the things that I always start with with, with a new student is this, is that what I'm going to take and cover with you is all a matter of logic. If you don't see the logic in it, then let's discuss it. And if I'm wrong about it, then uh, we'll take and figure out another way to approach it. But everything that we teach, we want it to be a very logical kind of uh, summation for you to be able to be effective as a shooter. And we know it all works because we've been doing it for a long time and we've had some incredibly good shooters that come along and that adopt our system. And, and uh, we're not the only one that, that are good teachers. A lot of them around the country. Uh, well, but, well here's, here's the other thing, too. Let me, let me kind of go a little further here. Uh, but there are people who are trying to pull people in another direction that isn't um, isn't really efficient, as Casey mentioned. and and. Uh, one of the things that I get often is that, Coach, if I do such and such, I'm going to get more power. No way. It doesn't happen. Not because, And you can't get more power on a shot uh, just because you swing your legs forward. That, that's going to probably make you less powerful. And the one thing that you need to remember is that the use of our power base is our core muscles and our lower body. And uh, we're pretty... Uh, uh, we're pretty cogent when we talk to people about that, that that's where the power base is. If you eliminate that power base, which often happens when people are learning how to shoot, or if they're shooting jump shots, um, oftentimes the power does not get transferred to the ball, and we're always flat and short. And so as soon as we make that adjustment, all of a sudden, wow, there it is. You know, one of the things that we are working with another youngster yesterday is they couldn't get the power. And, you know... Um, uh, they bend their legs, but they weren't bending them very much, and they weren't connecting to the shot. And so I, I kind of showed them this little thing here. I said, watch me break my legs down. And so I got into kind of a semi-squat, and I said, now watch this. And I dropped down about three inches or so, and I said, 
when you drop down about three inches or so, you're going to find you have way more power. You don't have to dip all the way down into a full squat. You just want it to be efficient, as Casey's talking about. And so efficiency probably is the most important thing uh, in shooting besides having the elements of the shot working for you. Yeah, and you know the thing is too is that we've run through all of our stuff with people that are, are experts in biomechanics and exercise physiology and all those things, and they agree with the things that we put together, and we've adjusted like the things that we we think work for shooting to to you know coincide with what they think too. Uh, you know, it's it's an evolution of of ideas. Um, you know, I'm sure that you're probably not teaching shooting the same way that you would have when you first started because it was a different time, you know. It was and, a different time, yeah. Um, and so, you know, everything has evolved. And the thing is is that, you know, we, we've we looked at it scientifically with people that know how to, to uh, or know the concepts behind that stuff and made it kind of what our concept is. Right. Um, and, you know, if people have other thoughts on shooting, that's fine. But I think that you need to think yourself. Use your brain listen to people that know what they're talking about and and put those pieces together for yourself because if you're just listening to somebody without evaluating it and you see their demonstrations and stuff and you don't think about each little element then you're not doing yourself the best service you need to think about it yourself okay so let's well, move hang on, on hang on uh, l let me elaborate just a little bit more on there one of the things that comes out of this is is that you know there's there's a lot of people who are kind of talking about uh, this uh, dip and sway and turn and all that kind of stuff and and you know uh, just one comment on that and that is the fact that um, there's never any talk about how you hold the ball how you release the ball uh, any of that kind of stuff and that's that's probably the most key thing there is in shooting is how you hold it and how you release it and how you get the power to the ball. And so that's really important uh, for us. The other thing, and, and this is, um, I would be really aware of anybody who is telling you that everybody else knows nothing and they know everything about shooting and that all of the stuff that the other stuff that's being taught today is antiquated uh, from a century ago. That's not true. Because like Casey was saying, there's that, uh, all people who are involved in the uh, the shooting things in basketball evolve their uh, mechanics pretty much as they need to. And you find that some of the people around the country who are teaching pretty solid stuff, they're all going to be on about the same page. And they're not criticizing and cutting down everybody else as being dumb and, and uh, don't have uh, uh, living in the past sort of stuff. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And he, and we can talk about stuff later. But uh, you know, the other th thing about making more shots is this: is that you have to have your mechanics and everything in line, and you have to have them so that they are just second nature to you. And when you catch the ball, you don't even have to think about it. It's just it's one of those things where your body just it's, knows how to respond. It's muscle memory. Yeah. And then the next part of it is knowing how to create space. Um, if you're just a guy that stands there and waits to catch the ball and shoot it, uh, good luck. Uh, that's going to be f fun trying to get your shot off because you know what you'll you'll just have a guy that just stands there and, and defends you and then you'll never catch the ball, right. um, which negates your ability to shoot. So if you're able to do things like uh, move without the ball, which is uh, doing things like L cuts, V cuts, back doors, set screens, um, even give and go situations. Um, well, you know, when you're talking about screens, Casey, there's a number of different screen situations that are really important that probably not enough attention is given to. You know, we talk about uh, on-ball screens. Uh, we talk about off-ball screens. We talk about down screens where we're uh, screening toward the baseline for somebody who is going to break up. Um, back screens, people who are playing lower on the uh, court toward the baseline who screen up for other players and so there's a, like Casey saying there's a ton of things that everybody needs to learn how to do to play basketball efficiently yeah I mean these these are things that that are next level basketball stuff okay you've got all the mechanics down you can dribble around you can catch the ball you can shoot it whatever that's great but there's a next level where you have to learn how to move without the ball yeah. and move with the ball yeah. So, you know, but if you if you learn how to move without the ball, you will find yourself getting a ton of opportunities to score or to even set up a teammate. Right. Uh, if you're not getting the ball very often, the reason is probably that you are not moving without the ball. But if you're setting up these opportunities to get uh, the ball in your hands or to set up somebody else, um, more times than not, you will end up getting the ball back 
or, or have an opportunity for you to score. So, Well, you know something that would be really interesting for you to do? Uh, there's games on this afternoon, uh, NBA games, and probably this evening as well, is to try watching the basketball game and not focusing on the basketball. Focus on all the other players, and you're going to see a ton of movement. And the movement sometimes what cut from one side to the other uh, going baseline. Sometimes they cut from one side to the other going over the top. They're down screening. There's you're so much movement in in a professional basketball, um, and they have to be, or they'd never be able to catch the ball. And so uh, that is a really important part of the basket of the game of basketball is just learning how to move and learning how to move without the ball. Because and, and even even the big guys. I mean, yeah. you'll see, you know, uh, the the big tall dudes are not just standing there in the middle waiting for the the ball. Some of them do that more than they should, but. The really great ones are flashing in the post. They're setting a down screen. They're setting a, a screen opposite on the other side of the post. They're coming up for high um, screens for yeah, screen roll. Yeah. Um, they're flashing to the ball. I mean, there's a ton of things that those guys do. Watch somebody like Tim Duncan or Joakim Noah. Those guys are moving all the time, and they're creating opportunities. And, you know, Tim Duncan, he's not the quickest guy anymore, especially, um, but he is doing all these little things to get more opportunities to shoot and to make more shots, yeah. which is why he is, you know, 18 years older than a lot of those guys that are out on the floor, and he is still a dominant player because he is doing all these little things that make it hard for, for people to defend him and creates these open shots. Yeah, you know, one of the things I was reading in an article uh, yesterday, and I thought it was just awesome, was, and they were talking about Coach Popovich of the Spurs, and and they were talking about how uh, his offense is one of freedom, and uh, one of freedom meaning that they don't have an awful lot of set plays. They have a few, but for the most part, he relies on his players to play the game of basketball with their innate uh, uh, abilities and uh, their smarts. And, and uh, he says oftentimes they'll call a timeout and they'll come to the side and he will just say to them, I got nothing for you, and he'll turn and walk away. Uh, and the idea there is that he's, he wants them to be a little bit more creative and figure out what they need to do. And, and that's really uh, um, telling them, uh, you guys have this ability to play basketball, so use it. And what you, it comes out of it, you see like there's a ton of movement. Um, you know, Ginobili is incredible in moving with and without the basketball. And plus he creates so many good looks for himself as well and teammates. Yeah, and, you know, the thing about it is, too, is that the really great players know how to move without the ball and with the ball. Yeah. And, you know, you should you should strive to be the guy that can step out on the floor and you don't have to have some coach's direction on what to do. Yeah. I mean, it's great if you do, but you need to be able to play without that and be able to create opportunities outside of some set offense. Yeah, yeah, and, and it really makes it very difficult for other teams to play against you uh, mm -hmm. because if they have scouted, they don't have a real clear picture of what it is that you're going to be doing, and, and that's that's really, really good stuff. Okay, so here's here's the bottom line when it comes okay. to wanting to make more shots. there It's not a special anything other than this combination. Uh, you want to get your shooting mechanics uh, dialed in, get a ton of, of repetition so that they are, you know, second nature, the muscle memory is there. And then the most important part, well, uh, maybe not the most important, but definitely a very important part is learning how to create space with and without the ball. Right. So you're able to, if you have the ball in your hands, you need to be able to, to create space to get off an uncontested open shot. And then you need to be able to create space without the ball so that you can create opportunities to get the ball and that still might open you up to to having an open shot as well. So those are kind of the components that are essential if you want to learn how to make more yeah, shots. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we're going to stop that right there. And, you know, you guys have been sending us questions the whole time. Um, but I want to ask you to keep sending us your questions. So if you have a basketball question that you want us to answer or take a stab at, um, send them to us either on Twitter, which is the best spot, um, or in the chat, or in the Q&A on Google+. And we'll try to get to everybody if we can. Now would be the best time because later we, we get a bunch at the very end and it's hard to get through everybody. But do that. Send them to us, at Shot Science. Then um, make sure you go out there and tell your friends and family to join the chat so that we have more people to check it out. Helps us get more cool guests. And uh, I guess we'll jump into it right now. Okay, let's see. <clears throat> Got to pick one first. 
This one is from Shard Axie. Shard Axie in the chat. He says, hey, coach, I'm 13 and I'm from Ireland and I play for a basketball team and only started playing in January. I have decent dribbling skills with my right hand and I'm improving my left hand every day. I play shooting guard and I'm 5'6 and I have a real passion for the game since I started playing and my dream is to be the best that I can be at the game. Could you please talk about this on the show and reply to this question, what is the best way to play shooting guard and what is the best way to practice at home because I find myself just shooting and laying up, so please tell me what I should be doing at home when practicing. Okay. Yours sincerely, Stephen Hardiman. Uh, thanks for reading. Okay, S Stephen. You know, something that is really important uh, for you to remember is this. You develop your game with uh, your shooting in your game with what we call form, the form shooting drill. And if you could check that out as one of our videos, and it'll explain to you uh, why that is so important. Once we get into that form shooting drill, we're actually looking at all the mechanics of the shot. And those mechanics are some uh, things that you want to be, number one, good, efficient, and productive. And you get that by practicing a whole bunch. Now, just going and shooting layups and shooting around isn't going to do that much good for you. That's kind of casual approach. That's a casual approach where you're not really focusing on the elements of your shooting at all. But when you get into that form shooting drill, you find that that really will help you to shape your, sh your shot and make it much more effective for you. Okay, and so the and that practice you can do at home, uh, you can do it at school, you can do it at playground, wherever you want to. But um, one of the things that I do is is if I have a student who's brand new, is that very first day we'll go through all the elements of the shot, and then we'll practice that, and then we'll take and go over the form shooting drill and explain to them that okay, this is what you want to do and how you do it. You're going to make 10 shots from this particular spot. We have five locations that we use and you make 10, but they all have to have good elements in order for you to to make them. We can take and shoot shots that are super flat and they'll still go in. Uh, we can shoot them with, uh, uh, without falling through our wrist, and they will go in sometimes. But what we want to do is get all of those elements in every shot that we count. We don't count any of those that don't have all the mechanics that are working well for us. What we're trying to do is uh, uh, not give any special attention to our, our poor mechanics, but give all this attention to our good mechanics. And so the, if you do this every day, and if you do that form shooting drill every day, you'd be surprised in a matter of just a few days how your shot is going to improve. Yeah, okay, and here's a quick rundown of the three pillars of practice. I'm sure we'll hit it again before the end of the day. <laughs> Number one is dial in your mechanics, and you do that with the form shooting drill especially when it comes to shooting. Um, and remember, the three pillars apply to any kind of practice for any kind of sport on any kind of skill. But this is for shooting. Form shooting drill to dial in your mechanics, number one. Um, number two, game speed, game intensity practice. So you're working on you know, your shooting that you developed in, in the first pillar uh, at game speed, at game intensity. So maybe you're getting a defender in there to, to help guard you or you're visualizing that defender or or you're having uh, you know somebody set up uh, you know you coming off a, a curl or something like that and you're catching the, the pass and going up for the shot at game speed or you're flipping it to yourself at game speed um, and you're just setting up those situations so that you know what it feels like to step out on the court and actually shoot the basketball Maybe you're a little bit tired. Maybe you have a defender in your face. Maybe he's playing off of you. You're, you're getting a different feel for, for how to shoot outside of just sitting there working on your form, which is great, but you have to have this other element too. Third pillar is game experience. So you're going out and you're playing pickup games. You're playing traveling team games, high school games, middle school games, whatever, um, and you're applying all the things that you learned in those first two pillars into actually getting game experience so that when you step out on the floor anywhere, you're able to uh, have those skills ready to go for you. Yeah, and it's not something that you're able to develop in a few days either. One of the things that, that comes uh, quite often is that doesn't feel comfortable. Well, anytime you're trying to do something different, it's not going to feel comfortable from what you've been doing for quite a while. And so what you want to do is examine, first of all, is this, is this correct? Is this effective? Is this efficient? And if it is, Fight your way through it being uncomfortable until it does become comfortable. Because once it comes becomes comfortable, then you're, everything is going to come together on that particular shot. No matter whether it's follow through with the wrist, the fingers, 
uh, full extension of the arm. One of the things that happens an awful lot uh, to uh, shooters in the beginning is that they reach the end of their arm and they pull the, they snap the arm back. Well, we don't complete the shot right there, and oftentimes that shot comes up short. And so we emphasize the fact that you want to get out to the end of your arm, follow through with that uh, limp wrist, and make sure that you hold that for at least two seconds or until the ball reaches the basket. Those are important considerations for you. Yeah, and here you're talking about doing layups and stuff too. Layups is the same exact uh, practice approach. Yeah. Dial it in with the slow kind of uh, uh, methodical approach where you're kind of looking at each little element of it, and then do the game speed, game intensity, and then practice on games. Um, and then you're also talking about here, uh, what, uh, let's yeah. see, what is the best way to play a shooting guard? Um, what we always say is that you should never pigeonhole your position. You should always try to be the best all-around basketball player that you can be. So that means working on all your skills across the board, and being able to step in at any position. So you could be able to play point guard just as, as easily as you could step in and play center, despite what your size is, because well, you'll be in a situation where you probably have to do the skills associated with that position anyway. Absolutely. And, and, and here's the thing, too, is that so often guards uh, uh, become guards. They are not just shooting guards and not just point guards. They're guards, and those guards are, pl are, are players first who happen to be able to shoot the basketball. One of the things that's going to happen to a shooting guard very often is if you demonstrate that you can shoot the ball effectively, you're going to have a defender in your face. They're going to be up so close you can smell their breath. And, that's, and so that's going to take your shot away. What are you going to do then? And so you have to have uh, uh, shaped your offense so that you can shoot and so you can attack the defender effectively and get to the basket possibly. Those are real important considerations. Like Casey says, first of all, you want to become a really good, well-rounded basketball player because one of the things that happens, you may be a, 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 a guard right now, maybe a point or a combo guard or whatever, but in two years, a coach may say, yeah, I want you to play the three. I want you to play the four. And uh, all of a sudden, then you have to start relearning more stuff. Just develop as a or, basketball player. Or make yourself more valuable because – you might find that you're trying to get on a team and there's already two guys ahead of yeah. you that are playing the shooting guard or whatever, yeah. and then what do you do? Are you going to be third string guy on shooting guard? Well, what if there's an opening to play the point guard and you could be that number one guy if you had worked on your skills? Or maybe maybe a, a three or four, who knows? Um, make yourself more valuable because then you will find yourself being picked up by more teams than you would otherwise. Yeah. And I know that you love to put the SG by your name, but it's like, <laughs> that doesn't matter. Uh, you know, if, if you are able to get on a team and play, that's what really matters. And it, in the final judgment, it's not going to be your choice where you play anyway. You're, you're actually going to have a coach, more than likely, who is going to tell you, I want you to play here, I want you to play there. And so, like Casey's saying, if you develop the skills that you, where you could play any place, wow, pretty valuable guy. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Stephen. And yeah. And go we, Ireland, yeah. Yeah, go Ireland. Um, You're talking a couple of Irishmen right here. Yeah, so definitely let us know what the, the what the scene is like over there in Ireland when it comes to basketball because yeah, yeah, we have be, no idea. Yeah, that'd be great to know. Looks like we have another one too. Wild Pow 757 is from Ireland as well. Yeah. Cool. All right. Thanks for being here, you guys. We like both of you guys. Um, yeah, and, and he Stephen also uh, hit us up on Twitter, so that's cool. Um, remember to send us your questions. Twitter is the best place, at Shot Science. Okay, now we're going to go to Twitter. Um, this one is from Elias, who is at Mr. Drudy on Twitter, and we've had questions from him before a lot. Um, he says, can one get to an elite level by just being athletic rather than skilled and vice versa? Do they go hand in hand? Mm, you know, not, not that many people uh, uh, in the general population are what you would call athletic or super athletic. And so you better be able to have some other uh, ammunition in your game. And that ammunition means that uh, maybe you are not very quick, but you've got great handles. Uh, you're not very fast, but uh, you can really shoot it. And so what you want to do is work on a combination of things. And if you can couple those, those skills uh, of basketball with athleticism, you are, you're going to be worth gold. Yeah, but I mean... There is an element of truth that athleticism will get you very far, but these when we're talking about athleticism of people in the NBA, it is Those it guys is, are it crazy. is it, this is not normal. No, no. <laughs> I mean these guys are, you know, six foot eight to seven feet tall 
and they will run faster than you, jump higher than you, they're faster than you, and they're quicker than you. Well, um, one perfect example is is uh, the other evening in the game um, uh, when Kevin Durant fast breaks, uses a euro step, and dunks the ball. I mean, how many guys in the world can do that? You yeah, know, just crazy. Well, stuff. I mean, he's seven feet tall too. And, yeah, and you know the thing is, is that sure, athleticism will take you very far, and everybody in the NBA almost regardless of who they are. I mean, people will be like, oh, Steve Nash, he's not as athletic as so-and-so. Steve Nash is super athletic. Yeah, he is. Um, he is, he is a, a top elite athlete in just in terms of athleticism. It's just it's not the athleticism that you would see in somebody like LeBron. Yeah. Uh, you know, Steve Nash is super quick. He has incredible body awareness, court awareness, all these things that add into his athleticism, well, um, his speed. Um, and... Uh, and, you know, the thing is, is that you will get by on some athleticism. And, you know, even when I played, like, in high school or middle school, there's guys that were ahead of the game when it came to athleticism. Eventually, it catches up with you, and you're, if you're not able to execute using your, your skills, then you're going to find yourself uh, not getting to uh, the next level, which happens to a lot of guys because, sure, they kick butt in, in high school, and they're these athletic freaks, they go up to Division One basketball, and they come back three months later because they were not able to cut it. They didn't have the skills. They couldn't put the ball in the basket. Um, so there is an element of truth to what you're trying to get at, I think. But uh, you do need to have both. Yeah. You can, really and I mean, you can't just get by on just having skills either. You have to be able to run the floor and and defend and stop other players. Uh, you, there are tricks that will make you be able to to make up for deficiencies in your athleticism, but you want to work on all aspects of your game. You know, uh, one of the things you were mentioning a while ago was about Steve Nash. You know, I happen to know uh, uh, a guy that played on the uh, Canadian national team with him, and what, what we heard was this, is that guy was a total freak when it came to uh, just uh, spending time working on his skills that he would spend hours upon hours upon hours working on his skill development where other guys would not do that. And so that's one of the reasons, too, that he has gotten so far is that he spent so much time developing his skills to go along with the athleticism he does have. Yep. Um, okay, here's another one from Elias. He says, uh, how to handle a hand-checking opponent? I saw the hammer video you made. Should I speak with the ref at all? You know, uh, <clears throat> It probably is not going to do you a whole lot of good because uh, officials look at that as whining. However, uh, I noticed uh, that in the United States, the, uh, the uh, national high school uh, rules changes for next year are to include uh, more of an emphasis on the lack of hand on, on the use of hand checking by defensive players. Now, the big question is this. Um, and they talk about being able to misdirect the offensive player by using uh, the hand checks. And one of the things really interesting about the hand checks is that players typically will use the back of their hand on your hip. And you can really direct and push that offensive person off balance with the back of that hand. Meanwhile, the other hand is extended up here. And so the focus tends not to be down here where the damage is being done, but actually probably at that extended arm. But f officials are supposed to be uh, start calling this much closer next year. We'll have to see that it happens. But the hammer sure takes care of that kind of hand checking. And that's the usual type. Uh, people do not come up to you typically, and they'll take and put an open hand on your hip or your side like that. They'll usually the, use the back of their hand to kind of direct you. Either way, it's 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 a foul, and yeah. and you know, the thing about the hammer though is that people are are using it incorrectly a lot of the time. They're either swinging and and punching or whatever. That is not what it is. Um, it 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 has to be discreet, and it has to be almost like you're doing it in stride with your run. Exactly. Um, and you're not trying to hurt anybody. It's it's just a method to strip that hand off, and they'll think about it the next time. So you want to make sure that when, when you do it, it's not something where you're, you're winding up or you're doing anything like that. It's really just you're taking your arm and just putting it down across your, your hip, and, you know, that's your airspace. He shouldn't be touching you there anyways. Right. Um, and so watch that video and kind of look at the little micro elements of what we're trying to show you on how to do that. 
oftentimes if the, the arm as you swing it uh, ends up going higher than your hips uh, as you go and ends up up here someplace, what officials will often do is call you for that. But, you know, that's no more illegal than the hand check itself. So anyway. Yeah, but the referee has final call, so, they do. so they be do. discreet. And, uh, yeah. Okay, this one is from Luis Lopez, who is at LuisH3 on Twitter. He says, uh, what exercises do you recommend to improve shooting practice alone? Um, I'm from Venezuela. Um, well, hello from from California. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. We talked about it a little bit before. Th the three pillars of practice. You want to dial in your shooting mechanics with the form shooting drill. Then you want to step it up, do game speed, game intensity practice, where you're, you're practicing with a defender or whatever, but you're doing it at the speed and intensity of a game. And then you want to go get experience playing in actual games, uh, pickup games, organized games, club teams, whatever. Um, and that's kind of the way that you, you kind of, you can practice alone doing the first two. Uh, obviously, this, the third pillar, you need to have, uh, you know, more people involved. But that's, that's kind of the approach that, that we would take. Yeah, here's another little upside to or information on that situation of taking it to the games. Oftentimes what happens is that when we take things to the game, um, maybe they're new moves, they're maybe they're shots and stuff like that, we find that they don't work very effectively when we get into a game situation. Part of that is because all of a sudden we have a defender in front of us. Uh, another part of it is the fact that the, the level of intensity is pretty high and the speed of execution is pretty high as well. And so we tend to fail when we first try to do some of the things that work on. Let's say we're trying to take and, and attack somebody and, and get to the basket. And we're unable to do that sometimes. And so uh, I kind of liken this to uh, such skills as uh, learning how to ride a bicycle, learning how to skateboard, uh, learning how to ski, snowboard, so on and so forth. The fact that usually when we start there, even though we think we've got a pretty good handle on it, we fail. And the failure is the fact that we can't quite execute it in that situation. But don't quit there. One of the things is that that's usually how we kind of learn is we fail, 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 and then we have a success. And then we fail, fail, and then there's a two or three successes. And we kind of work it out how that thing has to work for us. And so the thing that's really important is to remember that is that just because you get into a game and the speed of execution and everything is a lot faster, that you're not – and you fail to execute. Maybe you're using a little crossover or maybe you're using a little flat back and you can't quite get it done. Don't give up on it because it just takes a while to figure out uh, how you need to do it in a game situation. And it comes after you have a few failures, just like riding a bicycle. Most people, and from time to time, I find a freakish person who got on a bicycle and rode it down the street. But that's not typical. Typically, we get on it and fall off. We get on it and we fall off. We get on and we ride a little ways and we fall off. And then after a period of time, we kind of figure it out, and then we're going halfway down the block with the, on the bicycle. Yeah. Okay, this one is from our buddy Premu, who's at Premu22. Thanks for always being around, man. Mm -hmm. uh, this one is, uh, he says, uh, what do you guys have to say about getting out of shooting slumps? Oh, okay. Keep uh, shooting, number one. Well, yeah. And, you know, um, there, <laughs> I have people who uh, call me often, coach, my shot's horrible. Uh, can we get together and take a look at it? Yeah, come on over. And so we visit the shot, and we see what he's doing or she's doing, and usually there's something that jumps out in the first few minutes. Oh, okay, here's what's going on and why you're having a little bit of difficulty. And so we need to work on this particular element and change it so it's being executed this way or that way. And usually that will help you kind of come out of it. But I have uh, another approach that I like even better, and that is this one. Anytime you're struggling with your stroke, focus on your finish of the shot. And the finish of the shot is we're talking about the, the arm extension and the finish with the wrist. That typically is where a lot of your problems uh, result. Sometimes the ball is being released off the last two or three fingers because you're supination uh, when you finish. Sometimes it's due to pronation when your arm turns to the outside. Sometimes what is caused by the fact that maybe the elbow is out when you start your shot and so we shoot a flat shot. So the thing that's really important is when you are having problems with your shot, Focus on your finish, and you go back and, uh, and visit those things. Okay, 
even video them for yourself so you can look at them and video them from the side, video from the rear, and video from the front, and just kind of examine what it is that's happening. And does that look like that's supposed supposed to be that way or not? And if it's not, then go ahead and make some changes. Here's my thoughts on it too. I think that you want to be your own best coach. Yeah. So know why you are missing certain shots. Um, is it flat? Is it hitting off the front rim? Is it hitting off the side rim? Um, are you coming up short? Uh, is the spin on the ball wonky? Yeah. Um, you need to be able to evaluate all those things on your own yeah. without any coach around because you know you are there 24 hours a day. You might get an hour with a coach if you're lucky. So be your own best coach. Know why things are not working for you yeah. um, and be able to analyze them. And we show you how to do that with our video on Fix the Shot. Um, if you look that up, we show you all the different ways that you can pick up on these things that are breaking down in your shot and be able to fix them for yourself. And then uh, the other thing is uh, always keep shooting because if, if you look at your shooting at, in just one little slice of your, of your life, you know, you might be down in a kind of a slumpy area and if you actually pull it out and you look at it over the longer scale, that will just be a little dip, and then you're going to have a big spike on some other at some other point, and that it'll, it'll all even out. Yeah. People that let themselves get into this frustrated slump, that's when over time you just keep going down. You can't do that. You have to keep shooting, keep knowing that it's going to go in every time you shoot, and uh, also be thinking about analyzing what's going on if you're if you're kind of missing as well. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of the approach that you need to take. You need to be analytical, but you also need to uh, just keep shooting too. Okay, we had a lot to get through. This is crazy. <laughs> um, this one is from Cameron Schull in the Q and A. He says, "How can you shoot uh, like Stephen Curry? Any drills?" Yeah, uh, Stephen Curry has put in the work. You just need to put in the work. Do things like form shooting drill, game speed, game intensity drills. Um, it, it's really just about getting your shot dialed in and then game speed, game intensity capable. That's that's what it is. Uh, you know, the thing about Stephen Curry is that he he is using all the fundam fundamental elements of shooting that any teacher would teach. So you need to, you know, just look at, the, at what fundamental shooting is and you, you're ready to go. Um, let's see. This one is from Ricky Jordan who says, the elbow of my shot is not straight and always on the side. Should I stick with what's comfortable with me or should I change my shot form? Okay. I've been trying to change it, but I never it never gets comfortable. Okay. Well, you know, anytime you make a change, I think we mentioned this a while ago, uh, Ricky, is that uh, anytime you do something different from what you've been doing every day for months or even years, it's going to feel really uncomfortable. And how you take and change that is make the adjustment and live with it being uncomfortable. Before long, it'll start to feel better and more comfortable, uh, and that's where you want to get. So it just that's how you do it. Now, if you've got your arm, let's see, your elbow of my shot is not straight. So and you got your elbow out then? Is uh, that if the, the elbow is out, that typically creates a flat shot. <clears throat> and so we want to bring the elbow in. Now, we don't want to tuck it way in, but we want to let it comfortably hang down here. And well, here's, here's how you do that too. Yeah. First, you want to have a slight shift of your body towards your shooting side. Exactly. So everything in your shooting side will line up. Your wrist, your elbow, your shoulder, your hip, your knee, and your foot. Everything is lined up and you'll have just a slight stagger to that side. And you know, if you look at our video on where to where to put your feet, I think is what it's called. Right. <clears throat> we show you how to do that. You know, you essentially can slide the instep of of your non-shooting side foot into the the instep of your shooting side foot and slide it out. And that'll give you kind of a good uh, uh, you know basis for having that slight stagger. And what that does is that if you're not if you're fully squared up to the basket you have to kind of jam that arm in to get it to where it needs to be. But if you have that slight turn or stagger, you're going to have everything lined up right in line. And since we don't have an arm in the middle of our chest, that's the kind of what you have to do to get everything in line. Well, in line. In line means that you've got the ball in front of your shooting eye. Now, some people think that that means this way. That's not what we mean. If you're shooting from a lower set, it wants to be lined up with the eye so that the, as your eye looks at the target, it should be your eye, okay, the go, ball. Go for it. Uh, your 
your eye, the ball, and the target, which is out in the distance. And so, uh, the, and some people will have the ball elevated, but you want it to be above and in front of the eye. If we shoot off the shoulder, we use this an awful lot in kind of demonstrating this. We shoot the ball over here. That's just like holding the gun out to the side, and so it is eye target, and the ball never comes into play there. Well, and here's we like the idea of taking and lining up uh, those items, eye, gun, eye, ball, and then the target. Well, here's the other thing, too. If you have it out here and you're trying to shoot, you, you don't, you're not going to have the vision on it at all yeah. to really line it all up. Yeah. And if you if you bring it in and you're trying to do it from here, you know that's not comfortable. But if you have it out here and you try to come across, there's extra motion there that's going to add into the variables of your shot. So that's not good either. So you want to have that slight turn or stagger towards uh, your shooting side. The other thing is is that if it's uncomfortable, you you might turn your hand a little bit. A lot of people try to jam their hand back behind so that it looks you know uh, straight back like this. That hurts my elbow to even doing that. What you can do is is do something that is called the yoke, where you have more of a Y shaped right in front of your eye. So it's it's just like this, and it's almost like you know if you were to take a shot put and put it right there, but you're you you have like that Y that's right in front of your eye, and then as you come up, your arm will naturally turn over, and uh, you know that will get your hand behind the ball. So that's that's kind of the best way to get that all lined up. Okay, we got to hammer through these. <laughs> Uh, lightning round now. Um, let's see. Let's go into the chat here because we got a lot here. Um, let's see. Let's go to the top and we'll go down. This is from Alpha Kenny Woon who says, "How do I set sturdy screens like the Spurs big men do?" Well, you get know, there early. Well, uh, yeah, and and make sure that you get your feet wide enough that it's difficult for them to step around. Oftentimes, officials will call you if you get your feet too wide, but you want to get them wide enough that it's difficult for them to get around. And the other thing is, when you get there, make sure you set yourself strong and don't lean into people. And if they try to go around you, don't try to get in front of them. You have to stay stationary, or you be called for the foul. Right. And uh, stay on the balls of your feet, too. Yeah. Don't be flat-footed. Um, and we're going to do some stuff on screens at some point, too, so uh, keep an eye out for that. This is from Sean Lewis, who says, what is your take on using a finger when you shoot the, to keep the ball straight? Yeah. Okay. You have to use two fingers. The, I mean, people keep saying this one finger thing. It, is, it, it, it doesn't hold up. One finger, look at the stability of the ball. It just wiggles around. I can't keep control of it at all. Two points of contact... Look at that. I can't roll it around. It's just it's it's because you have more surface area on different space on the ball that will hold it there. So, I mean if if people are telling you to do this one finger thing, think about if there's a slight breeze, it's going to knock the ball completely off. Yeah. Uh but if you have those two points of contact as the ball releases off of your fingers, it's going to be much more stable. And it, you know, think about throwing a baseball. You're, you know, it's it's that's why there's two fingers on the ball when you throw a baseball, is because it comes off of those two. It's going to be much more stable as it as it comes off. So that's that's our take on it. And you have better control. Yeah. And also keep your wrist very relaxed. Relax finger flop finish. Okay. okay. Here's Jenny again. Jenny said, or Jenny Ham, who's, yeah. who's Jenny here visits, all the time. Yeah, she visits a lot. Um, after you release the ball, should you follow the ball with your eyes or stare at the rim? S keep okay. your focus on the target. Yeah, you know, uh, sometimes you see people who will follow the ball with their eyes, but the the the, the idea is this: if I were shooting uh, a pistol, would I be looking around uh, at, to see where that was going? No. Our eye no, no, is no, right well, on the well, target. No, I mean, that's that's not even what it is. If you were looking at the pistol, you'd be looking at your fingers <laughs> yeah. squeezing the, the trigger. Yeah. doesn't make sense. No. Um, you know, you need to be looking at the target, having a soft focus on the target, the nest of, of the rim, yeah. and that's how you will be uh, making it. Yeah, you'll um, be much better. And you never look at the ball in the light, in our and, opinion. And the thing is, is that you need to be able to judge distance and, and have all these little... Uh, micro processes going on in your brain. How are you going to do that if you're looking at your hand or looking at the ball? Yeah. It, it just does not work. Um, let's see. Um, and you know, even after you release the ball too, that yeah. you shouldn't do that either because you're you're going to be thinking about uh, you know looking at the ball after release. It's another variable. Yeah. Don't do that. Yeah. Um, this one is from. 
Yomar is cool. One, two, three. Hello, uh, hello, I'm a shooting guard, and when I shoot the ball, it goes straight in. Uh, when I shoot the ball, it goes straight into a motion like Kobe shot, but my percentage is low. Should I shoot the ball lobbed like Stephen Curry? Okay. I, yeah. I don't really know what that means. but Well, I think I know what he means. Stephen Curry shoots with a very high arc, and I think that's probably... And, and Kobe shoots with a, a flatter arc. Uh, they're both good shooters, but, uh, you know... Our opinion is this, is that you have a larger landing area uh, if you shoot the ball with a nice arc. That landing area at the basket, uh, the hoop itself, gets smaller when the, the flat, uh, shot is flat. And if you want to find out more about that, take and go to our, our uh, video on how to get perfect arc. And that explains why we take and teach to have a higher arc. Yeah, there is an optimal kind of height. Yeah. Okay, this one is from Andrew, who says, Hi, guys, what do you think about the index finger release and any finger releases, four fingers down? Uh, I know you told us that there is no finger orientation, just flop finish, but there is many videos which tell us that the index finger is the best way to deal or to do great shots. What do you think about this? I asked you because I watched hundreds of videos uh, where, for example, Kobe Bryant, Michael Jordan, and other great shooters use this technique uh, which could it's one down, three up. Okay. Let me take this one. All right. This this is uh we just talked about it a little bit, but one finger gives you a less stable release. Two fingers gives you a much more stable release. Um, and you know the thing is is that we would never tell you that there's no finger orientation or whatever that is important. We think that the two fingers is important. Right. And the thing about it is that you must have a very relaxed flop finish, but it should still come off those two fingers. And when you bring up people like Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant, if you actually look at their shots and you look at them with the phantom or slow motion camera, you will see that the ball comes right off of those two fingers. Even if Kobe does his thing where he points that one finger down, it still comes off of those two fingers last. Yeah. Um, and, and, and to have three fingers up is there's no way. Here, and here's, here's the thing about that. When people tell you to do that, one down, three up thing, I feel the tension in my arm because you are adding tension to these fingers. You, and when you do that, you add it to the ball. So what you have to do is think about it logically. If I'm trying to have a very relaxed release and I'm not trying to add extra energy to the ball, I need to have a flop release where there is no tension going on in my hand. And if you look at somebody like Michael Jordan, he releases the ball and it's so relaxed and flop. You can just see them flop up and down. People occasionally take still shot photos of people where their hand comes down. And yes, sometimes if you catch them at the right time on that flop, it will look like they have that one finger down, three up. But if you actually look at the slow motion footage, it's just catching that one frame where it looked like that. You need to evaluate the mechanics of each person uh, that tells you how to shoot. And we're telling you that if you want a relaxed shot, that has a better chance of staying in and around the rim because you haven't added extra energy to the ball, you need to have a flop release. And if you want control and accuracy, it should come off those two fingers last. Well, so that's, that's, that's our thoughts on that. Just one real quick thought. Casey mentioned a while ago throwing a baseball with just uh, the thumb and the first finger. And the one thing is you can go out and throw that, bas uh, that baseball, but you haven't got any real control on where it goes. Well, you, as soon as you add that other finger, then you've got two points of control, and now you can <clears throat> actually direct it much better. Yeah, and you know the thing is you might throw five really great in a row with that one finger on there, but if you have one little slight thing that happens, it's going, you know, into the the stands, yeah. you know. So that if just think about what we're saying and think about it for yourself in your brain. It has to make some kind of 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 truth for you. Um we just did that one. Uh, Andrew? Yep. Okay. Uh, this one is from Mal Green, who says, I'm a power forward and I can shoot threes, but for some reason I can't shoot threes, and my jump shot and free throw is not too good. Any advice? Well, we kind of talked about how to get out of the shooting slump. Same, same type of deal. Keep shooting, work on dialing your mechanics, and know how to analyze what's going on with your shot. If you're having problems getting uh, distance on your three-pointers or whatever, work with the form shooting drill. Uh, progressively move back in segments so that you're building up your ability to shoot from those different distances and really work on, on generating the power in your lower body and connecting it all to your upper body. One more comment on that. One of the things that happens when we're shooting longer jump shots is oftentimes we tend to hold the ball at the top. 
Uh, in other words, we jump up in the air and we hold the ball momentarily. And as soon as we hold the ball, all of our leg thrust that is giving us all that power is no longer there. So we have to connect that leg thrust uh, to the stroke. And so what, how you do that is as you're reaching the top, not when you get to the top, as you're reaching the top, the ball should be on its way. Okay, we have a bunch of questions here that we think can be answered by checking out <laughs> videos. Um, so I'm going to probably direct you to those. We Lightning round. Uh, this is serious business here. Okay. So Rodney Butler says, what are some ways to get open as a forward? Check out these videos. They will help you immediately. How to L cut, how to V cut, how to back door. Check those out, Rodney, and you'll be set. Um, this one is from Pokey JJ Boy Plays. Coach, I'm 15 years old and I'm almost two meters, meters and I used to be a center. I can shoot very well and I can dribble very good. Uh, for the last few games, I played a guard, and it played out well, 26 points. Should I remain as a guard or go back to a center? Thanks for the videos. Keep it up. Be an all-around great player. Make yourself more valuable. Don't pigeonhole yourself to a position. Yeah. That's what we'll say there. Um, let's see. Another question about position. Our same, same advice. Um, Alpha Kenny Woon, is it worth doing long two-point shots? Um, if you are able to shoot those and you get an open look, yeah. yes. You want to be able to shoot them, yeah. Um, let's see. Game Changer 2 says, Hey, Coach, I do well in practice but not in games. What should I do? Check out our video called I Make in Practice, Miss in Games. If that's your problem, if you're making in practice and not in games. The other thing, <coughs> excuse me, the other thing is, is do the three pillars of practice. Dialing your mechanics, game speed, game intensity practice, and then get more experience. Yeah. Um, let's see, Chris Bulls says, my shot is pretty good in the beginning of practice games, but when I get tired, my shooting form gets messed up and I miss a lot of shots, a lot of easy shots. What can I do to make my shot more consistent when tired? Make, check out the video, make and practice, miss in games, and then check out the video, uh, how to have a consistent shot. Yep. Right? Yep, yep absolutely. Um, okay. Let's see. Hayden, Bre Hayden Brin says, or Brian says, currently I've developed my shot so I can go 7 of 10 mid-range, but when it comes to three-pointers, I always hit the front rim or I airball, uh, but I'm actually not a weak player. Do you have any advice? Okay. Quick one. Yeah. All right. Uh, it's because you're not using your legs. Oftentimes what happens is... Or you're not connecting. Well, that was where I'm going next, is that we have a two-part shot. In other words, we start, the legs extend, and we haven't started our stroke yet. And then as soon as the legs are finished, they produce no power after that. And so then it's just arm. So we need to connect the legs to the shot stroke. And how we do that is that the stroke begins before the legs end, and that will help you a whole bunch. This one is from Robert... Clint, who says, hey, coach, I've been playing basketball for three years now, and I've always been a right-handed shooter. However, I'm a left, I'm left-handed for everything else. I recently started to shoot left-handed, and I feel more comfortable and that I have a lot more control. Would you recommend the switch for the potential of being a better shooter with my left? Do you think it will pay off for Tristan Thompson, who has done the same? I would say if you feel more comfortable and yeah. it feels good, do that. And I mean, you're that, effective. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's no reason to stick with what doesn't feel more natural. Yeah, truly. Um, let's see. I think let's go up to the Q and A real quick. We're running out of time here, you guys. Uh, this one's from Cameron Schull, who says, "Can you tell me any drills to dribble better with your weaker hand?" Yes, check out our video series. That we we actually made a video called "How to Develop Your Weaker Hand," and in there we tell you how to do that, and we give you a bunch of drills. So check that one out. Um, let's see. This one is from Ryan. Heilman or Hillman, who says, how should I get better at shooting three-pointers? Practice the form shooting drill, and starting close, work back progressively. Yeah. Master the close ones, and then take a step back. Master that, take a step back. That's how and you do that. There's also a video, make the three-pointer, get your legs into it. That's an important one. Okay, then we have one here from David Vasquez, who says, uh, hola, saludos. He's from Mexico. I guess he's from Juarez. Chihuahua. How's it going? How are you? I'm glad you joined us from Juarez. Uh, let's see. This one is from Karthik Konuru, who says, Ray Allen makes a lot of shots and he dips. He is one of the fastest shooters in the league. I think he hop. I think the hop makes him fast, and when you do it so naturally, it makes you dip. If the hop made your shot faster with the dip, would you teach it? Uh, if it? Okay. We would teach anything that would make you better or make you faster or make you more efficient. The yeah. thing about it is, is that the dip does not do that. The hop does not do that. People that claim that it does are not aware of true biomechanics and they are trying to, uh, you know, 
make things uh, you know, make things th true that, that aren't really true. And they show you these examples of people. Number one, people in the NBA, that's not where you necessarily find all the greatest shooters. So that's not a good argument for saying you should shoot like these people. Ray Allen, however, is one of the greatest shooters. But I will say that he has worked incredibly hard to make his shot work for him. He's probably shot more shots than anybody could ever wish to shoot in his life. Um, and he's made it work for him. He probably dips because that's how he started doing it, and that was you know, the way that he generated rhythm. And the thing about the dip is this. It is only there to help you generate rhythm. Claims that it helps you jump higher or that it helps you do all these things, they are not true. Biomechanically, that is not how it works. The dip is only to generate rhythm. You can generate rhythm other ways that eliminate the dip, which will take out the variable of the dip, which exposes the ball to the defense, it's slower, and it, it's just another variable that can go wrong. The other way to do that is using your footwork. So when you're stepping into the ball, you are coming in with a lead foot and a trail foot, and you step down, and you, before you even catch the ball, you're taking care of a huge portion of your shot. So it's, you're, you're stepping into it, one, two, you already generated rhythm, no need to dip. You've already generated rhythm with your feet, so you can catch the ball and go straight up into the shot. That will be much faster than dipping and hopping because you're going from high to low to high as opposed to just low to high, and you're eliminating the motion of having to do the dip. There's no argument for it to be faster, more explosive, quicker. Uh, the hop is not more unbalanced or more explosive. If it was, you would see people doing that in the high jump, and they just do not do that. So any claims to that are, are unfounded. And the thing about it is, is that just because you see Ray Allen do it doesn't mean that you should do it. Take the fundamentals that make sense in your mind, start there, and you will have a great starting point for your sh shooting. Okay? Okay, we're going to take one more, and then we're out of here. This one is from... Uh, Smiles Oloko he says, you guys are awesome. I used to get pretty rough at basketball even though I was like six foot one, but your tips seriously help. I'm playing summer AAU and my school basketball coach says I'm all but locked in to play varsity even though next year is only going to be a sophomore. So Sweet. seriously, thanks. That's awesome. Sweet. Okay, Sweet. Let's, let's hit another question though. That's, that's awesome though. Yeah. Um, let's see. <sighs> Might have to reset this real quick. Let's maybe go to Twitter. I think we had another one on Twitter. This one is from – okay, maybe not. That was a really really long one that we can't do. Um, let's see. This one is from – okay, we'll just take this one from A.J. Johnson who just posted this. He says, what do you think is the best post move? You know, the best post move uh, is – you can only execute certain moves when the uh, the defender plays you in certain ways. So it depends on how they're playing you. If they're playing you on the high side, maybe drop step. If they're playing you right behind you, maybe you can, and it doesn't leave you the opening for the drop step. Maybe you got the spin move, or you step right over the top for the little jump hook. So it depends on how the defense is playing you. That really makes the difference, AJ. I think that is true. My I think my favorite though is the up and under. Yep. Because. <clears throat> the thing about it is that it looks like something you fake the guy out of his shorts like almost every single time you do it, and you get a little easy little bucket when you do the cross step. Yeah. So the up and under is probably my favorite. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I think that's going to do it for us today, you guys. I want to thank you so much for all your questions. If we didn't get to your question, it wasn't because we didn't like you. It was because we just didn't have time and we ran out. Uh, if you want us to answer your question, you can always hit us up on all of our social media sites. So if you want to hit us up on Twitter, we are at Shot Science, and we're on Facebook, Google+, um, and YouTube, and we're at Shot Science on all those places, so make sure you're there. Subscribe to us on YouTube. Um, and if you have a question, typically we have probably answered it in a video that we put out, so check that out. Um, let's see. If you want to have a personalized shooting coach, uh, you can email us at shotscience at gmail.com and we can try to set you up with uh, working with Coach Tom and, and he can be your shooting coach. Um, and we're going to do a beta program where if you guys want to do that, um, you know, it's going to be at a lower price now but it's going to be raised later. So if you want to get in now when it's going to be lower, I would suggest doing it ASAP because we're going to fill up spaces and if you, if you do that, uh, 
now, that is the time. Yeah. Um, we're going to have more on that later, but we just want to let you guys know first because you, you guys are kind of our loyal guys that are here every week, guys and girls. Um, so just send us an email if you want to do that. Um, let's see. Make sure that you come back next week. We're, we're going to be here at 1 p.m. Pacific time on Sunday. And uh, let us know what you guys think about the basketball games in the comments. Uh, you know, we're going to go watch the, the Lakers, uh, or not the Lakers, but the, yeah, not the Lakers. We're going to watch the Clippers and the uh, Oklahoma City Thunder right now. And I guess we will see you guys next time. All right. All right. Bye, guys. See ya.